Good. It's a good Sunday to be here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that I'm here. Uh, we are uh, starting a brand new series this week called God. Um, shockingly, uh, you're in church, so we found it appropriate to talk about God a little bit here and there. Uh, but we are excited. We're going to be spending the next nine messages, um, and I say messages because they're not all going to fall on a Sunday, um, talking about the character and nature of God. We're going to spend three, sun three messages or three Sundays talking about the character and nature of God the Father. And then after that, we're going to spend three Sundays talking about God the Holy Spirit. We're going to spend three uh, weekends talking about that. And then leading up to Easter, we're going to spend three Sundays talking about God the Son. We're going to uh, really kind of get as best as we can uh, just an in-depth uh, understanding of what the Bible says about who God is. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're going to be uh, kind of diving into what we would call Trinitarian theology, for those of you that might have been a little bit more schooled in church, but uh, we believe in the Christian scriptures that God is three and He is one. That God exists as three and one. God exists as one and three, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to unpack all of those uh, over the course of the next nine messages, because Good Friday is going to be involved in that as well. So I want to start off uh, with using this quote as kind of the basis for the next nine messages together. And it's a quote from A.W. Tozer. Some of you might have seen this before if you've ever read any of his work. But Tozer says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. This is why we're doing the series. Our hope is, and my hope is, is that we'll be able to give a, a truthful and somewhat limited but comprehensive understanding of who God is because our understanding of God as an individual is the most important thing about us. In light of that, I'm going to say something maybe bold. This might be a little bit offensive to some of you. Um, but my guess is, is that your understanding of God may not be completely true, nor is it totally comprehensive. Let me say that again, that possibly your understanding of God is not completely true, nor is it comprehensive. And I say that with all humility, and I say that about myself as well, because God in many ways is too big for us in our little finite pea brains to understand, right? Yes or no? Yes, it's very difficult. God is a mystery. And I love that about God being so big and so mysterious, because if we could fully define God and put him in a box, is he God? No, he's not. And so what we're going to do for the next nine messages, we're going to unpack some of this mystery to help us understand what does the Bible say about who God is. Now, for church people, if you're a church person, and probably a lot of you would consider yourselves to be church people, you probably feel like you know some things about God. You've read them in the Bible, maybe you know, you've had a personal relationship with God for many years and you have a little bit of an understanding um, but there may be some of you in here that are just still trying to figure things out, and you're like, I'm, I'm kind of confused. I hear a lot of things about who God is, and I read a lot of things about who God is, and I pray a little bit, but I'm not quite sure who I'm praying to, and there's a little bit of confusion, and that's totally understandable. Some of you have just flat out made stuff up about God, let's just be honest. You're like, well, I don't really like that aspect of what the Bible says about God, and so I'm just going to pretend that that doesn't exist. And I'm going to make God in my image rather than submitting to the fact that God made you in his image. You're going to be like, oh, I don't like that God. I'm going to manufacture a self-made God in my mind, which ultimately makes you to be your own God, right? Does that make sense? And so some of us have just made up things about God because that's what's comfortable. Maybe that's what we've known or we don't, we're uncomfortable with what the Bible says, some of you may have been raised in a religious system that just was flat out false teachings about God. You've grown up your entire life thinking that God is this when the Bible actually says it's something very, very different. Some of you in here this morning may not believe in God at all. You don't want to be here 
and you were promised brunch after church if you would go to church with your family. And you're like, I'm, you know, tuning in. I know people, men in particular, I've had some in my life that just come to church for the academic experience. There's really not a desire to know God, but they're like, I I, want to know what the Bible has to say, and that's awesome. We're so glad that you're here. Some of you have a really distorted view of who God is because of your previous experience, whether in your church or in your own family. It's pretty well known that most of us get a picture of who we believe God is through the example given to us by our earthly father. And if our earthly father has let us down or was abusive in any way, we have a tendency to think of the heavenly father in the same light as the fatherly experience that we had on this earth. There are some, and this is probably one of the most popular uh, ideas about God in our culture today, is many just throw up their hands and they say, well, all religions and all gods basically teach the same thing. All gods, you know, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Jehovah Witness, whatever, you know, uh, Buddhism, they, they, it's basically all the same thing, and they all just kind of worship the same God. It's just a totally different name. And, and if you have any ounce of education about religion or about God or about reasoning at all, you know that that just cannot be true. It just can't be true. How can competing ideas of who something is be the same? It just rationale tells us that that's not even possible. It's not even close. In fact, I would make the argument, and if you fall into this, I say this with no disrespect, but it's lazy. It's just laziness. If we really want to understand who God is, let's take the time to figure it out. Let's investigate it for ourselves. So, who is God? Where do we find out some of the answers to the mysteries of who God is? What is God like? Can He be known? What does He want from me? These are important questions because the answer to those, as Tozer argues so well, the answer to those are some of the most important answers that you could ever come up with in your own life. So this stuff is super important. The truth is, and this is one of the basis that we're going to build this whole series on, is that we believe in the Christian faith that God can be known. In fact, God wants to be known, right? He has revealed Himself, that we believe that Scripture, that the Bible itself is God's revelation of who He is and His relationship to all of humanity from the beginning of time until now and even into the end of times. That God not only has created everything, but He wants to be known by His creation, and He has revealed Himself in very practical and very real ways from one generation to the next. Now, our understanding of God continues to, you know, I don't want to say evolve, but we continue to learn new things about God because God is infinite, and we live in a finite world. And so we, even in the Christian faith, are going, wow, like, God just kind of blows out the box of everything that we thought we knew about Him. So much of us, even in our Western Christianity, have such a narrow view of who God is and what the Holy Spirit's doing throughout the world. It's so important for us to just say, you know what, let's go back to Scripture and let's just kind of blow out some of the things that we think we know about God, and let's see what the Bible has to say about who God is, if we truly believe that, God, that the Bible is one of the primary ways, if not the primary way, that God reveals Himself to humanity. And my hope and my prayer for us in this series is that, man, that, that you'd just be full of awe of who God is. You know, maybe, maybe your faith has just become regimented or boring. Maybe your prayers have become weak or sporadic or, you know, maybe your, your passion for the Lord has gotten, you know, like, really low lately, and that maybe as we just take some time over the next couple of months just to look at God, that maybe your passion for Him, maybe your um, desire to know Him just grows and grows and grows, ultimately, that all of us would relearn once again what it means to have a personal relationship with this amazing God that we worship. 
And so what I want to do to begin our series, our three-parter on God the Father, is I want to begin to look at one of my favorite stories and word pictures of God in the Bible. It comes out of Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to grab one of those Bibles out of the, out of the uh, seats in front of you, um, you go to the book of Isaiah. It's kind of like if you go to Psalms and you, you know, keep going a little bit further, it's in the Old Testament. If you need to use the table of contents in the front, that's fine, or use your Bible out. But what I think this passage does so well is it illustrates so many of the profound truths about who God is and what our relationship or maybe our posture should be before God. And so what I want to do is I want to read these eight verses, and I'm not even going to be able to do these eight verses justice. In fact, nine messages on the character and nature of God is not even going to like hit the tip of the iceberg as far as this goes, but I felt like this was one of the more foundational passages that we can um, examine together, help us understand a few of the character traits of who God is and, uh, and what that means for every single one of us. So Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. If you're there, say word. word. All right. That's a, good, that's a good word this morning. Well done, folks. That's good. Be proud of yourself. Those of you who didn't bring your Bible, don't be proud of yourself. Feel guilt, okay? <clears throat> I'm kidding. Um, guilt can be a good thing sometimes, not all the time, but anyway, all right. Um, all right, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Now, this, just to give a little bit of background here, so this is Isaiah, the, the prophet of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, God would speak through prophets. The first prophet that was the one that is probably the most famous uh, Jewish prophet of all time is Moses. God spoke through Moses. He gave the law to the nation of Israel through Moses, and through the prophets, was the primary way that God would speak to his people in the Old Testament. Now, being a prophet was not a fun thing. Prophets were never received well. People always hated them. In fact, they would be martyred or they would be tortured or they would be mocked because you never want to speak on behalf of God. Now, prophets love speaking on behalf of God when it's all good stuff, right? Oh, you guys are awesome, right? But that's not how the prophets are. They're like, you're a bunch of weirdos you're a bunch of sinners, you're a bunch of idolaters, you need to knock it off or God's going to strike you dead. And they're like, mm, we don't like you, right? Like, and so they received a lot of, uh, of hardship from the people. So it was not a job that people would seek out, but God would appoint a prophet for a specific season in the life of Israel. And in this season, it's Isaiah's. And this is, it actually gives a historical timeline for when this event happened. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died... I, being Isaiah, saw the Lord. That's a pretty bold statement. Like, he saw God himself, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth. And said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. I'm going to read that again, and I want you to close your eyes and put yourself in Isaiah's shoes in the throne room of God. Just close your eyes and just let's listen again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sounds of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sins atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. The first and one of the most important pictures that Isaiah paints for us is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. God the Father is holy. Of all the attributes of God throughout all of the Bible, His holiness is spoken of most often. In fact, Isaiah talks about God's holiness 33 times alone in this book. And in the entire Bible, God is described as holy 675 times. Now, in this passage, it's, it's recorded how many times is the word holy said? The answer is three. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, in the Jewish tradition, when something would be repeated three times, it was a uh, word of perfection, as if God Himself, the angels are declaring that God Himself is perfectly holy. And think about this, of all the things that the angels in heaven can sing about God, and that's a lot, right? They're not up there going, justice, justice, justice. Grace, grace, grace. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Obey, obey, obey. Wrath, wrath, wrath. Grace, grace, grace. Whopper, 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 whopper. None of those. What is it? It's holy, holy, holy. They are declaring the holiness of God. The Hebrew word for holy is the word, is the word kadosh. Say kadosh. Okay, it's like skadoosh, but it's kind of different, right? Right? Could, you're going to think, every time you think of holy, you're going to think of skadoosh now, right? right? For those of you cartoon fans. But kadosh has three facets to help us understand what the holiness of God really is. There's several nuances to the Hebrew word for holy here in Isaiah chapter 6. The first one is that holy means to be set apart. The, the word literally means to be cut off. That's what kadosh means in Hebrew. It means to be cut off. As if you were to cut something off a garment, it would be completely separate from us. It would to be, um, and because God is completely separate from all of his creation, he cannot fully be known because he is completely set apart. In many ways, like when God talks about us as Christians being holy, it's not talking about us being sinless, right? Can I get an amen? We're not sinless. What it says is that we're set apart for purpose. And Kadosh has a, has a much more transcendent understanding when it comes to the character and nature of God, that God is set apart from everything else. There is none like Him at all. There aren't multiple gods. There aren't competing gods. There is only one true God. His name is Yahweh. The second facet of what Kadosh means is um, to be holy or to be transcendent. There's, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into a debate about who the greatest NBA basketball player is of all time, but you could say the same thing about Michael Jordan as you could about LeBron James, and this is, many people would say that these were two of the athletes within professional sports that transcended their sport, right? That their influence was bigger than just playing on the court. 
They weren't just a leader on the court, but they were a movement leader outside of it. They talk about those transcendent athletes in sports or transcendent artists that go above and beyond the, the parameters of what they do. And there's a sense in, in, in this word where God is completely transcendent. He is outside or bigger than everything in all of creation. God is above and he is beyond his creation. Let me make this clear. The Bible does not teach that God is creation. So there is no such thing in the Bible as Mother Earth. God is transcendent above his creation. He is not limited to or in creation. We don't worship creation. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, God said that was one of the original sins of humanity is that they started working creation rather than the created God, the creator God. And that was one of the downfalls of, of humanity. And so we don't worship creation. We appreciate creation because why? Because God created it and it's awesome and it's beautiful. But it's not to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped. He is the only one that is transcendent. Third aspect of holy, which is probably the one that you know most about, is that God is perfect and without sin. He is absolutely perfect and without sin. This is illustrated of why the seraphim, which are the angels in heaven, right? How many go, want to go to St. Bonaventure High School? Any St. Bonaventure graduates in here? None? Okay. Okay, a couple. Okay, yeah, you're like, Private school, hmm, you know, like I, <clears throat> afraid to raise your hand, um, right? But what's your, what's the, what's the uh, mascot for St. Bonnie? The seraphs, right? That's where it comes from. They're the angels in heaven that are around the throne room of God. And the angels are illustrating the holiness of God by what they're doing with their wings. With one of the sets of wings, they're covering their eyes because God is so holy, they can't even look at him. All throughout all the Old Testament, Isaiah is one of the few that has looked God in the face. All other people who would ever see the presence of God would catch his backside, right? Because he was so holy that he knew people would die if they walked into the presence of a holy God. Isaiah is standing there in front of the Lord, and the angels are covering their eyes. He is so holy that they can't look at him. And they're covering their feet, right? Why are they covering their feet? Well, Feet also represent an aspect of holiness. Remember when Moses stood before the burning bush? He saw the burning bush, and the burning bush called out to Moses and said, hey, I need you to take off your sandals because where you're standing is what? Holy ground. So the angels are covering their feet, even though they're not even walking, which is kind of weird, but they're covering, it's a symbol of God's holiness. And they're singing of God's holiness over and over and over again for all of eternity. Some of you guys maybe have been paying attention online to what's happening at Asbury College out in Kentucky. And, and the revival that's happened amongst the student body, there's like lines, like a thousand people waiting to get into this chapel. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go online and watch it. It's a pretty incredible movement of what God is doing over there. And that's been, this is in their 11th day. This is all of eternity. All of eternity, the angels are singing the praises and the holiness of God, something we can't even fathom. But God's holiness means that he is completely separated from anything that is also unholy. Because he is transcendent, he is separate from it, and he cannot be in the presence of sin because of his holiness. Second thing that Isaiah points out in this is God's omnipotence is that that's a big Bible word, that God is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. The seraph are worshiping him as he's seated on his throne. He is the king, and he is all-powerful. It says even just the voices of the angels shook the pillars of the temple in heaven, just the power of the angels itself. But they're worshiping this God because he is all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. And they're standing in front of this all-powerful God. It's so important for us to remember just how powerful God is in our lives. One of the greatest misnomers of humanity is that we think we're in control. We are not in control. It's an illusion 
of our lives. If you've ever experienced some level of tragedy or a miracle or something that is totally unexplainable, you realize, I am not in control at all. Ultimately, God is the one who is sitting on His throne, not me. And God's power can be described in two words biblically, one being that His power is supreme, which means He has the right to do whatever He wants to do. God has the right to do whatever He wants to do. And he's also, his power is also absolute, which means he has the capacity to do whatever he wants. So he has the right to, and he has the capacity to. And when we stand before an all-powerful God, who am I to tell God what's right and wrong? Who am I to tell God he's not fair? Who am I to tell God that I'm in control of my life? Can you imagine if Isaiah walked into the throne room with that posture? God's like, let me show you something. Right? Let me show you something. Job tried that. If you've ever read the book of Job, it's kind of a very difficult, confusing book to read. But if you read the first chapter or two, you'll kind of get the sense of it, and then you can skip all the way to Job chapter 38. <laughs> am I right or am I right? Because for like 35 chapters, you're like, I don't know what, what's, this is just poems, like I don't understand what's happening. But you go to Job chapter 38 when Job questions God about all the things that are going on in his life. And God just opens up all of creation to him, and he says, basically, he's like, Job, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. You don't have a clue. God is omnipotent. But then this is the one that hits me real hard in this passage, this other aspect of the character and nature of God, is that God, our Father, is gracious. He's so gracious. In verses 6 and 7, here you have Isaiah, a sinner, standing before a holy God. And what does God command the angels to do? God commands the angels to take a piece of coal off the altar with these tongs. It's very similar to what the priests would do in the temple during, uh, during the Day of Atonement. The coal represented fire or represented refining. It also represented forgiveness. As, the, as the, uh, the sacrifices were burned on the altar during the Day of Atonement, they would take those coals and they would be symbols of the fact that God no longer sees the sins of the nation of Israel. And, and Isaiah, or God uses the imagery here with Isaiah where the seraphim picks up that coal and he touches the lips of Isaiah and he says this, he says, see, this has now touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for, meaning you're forgiven. You're forgiven. I mean, just the mere fact that God would allow Isaiah to stand in the throne room of God in the heavens is gracious enough. Can I get an amen? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never done that before. I don't know very many people that have, but the fact that God would allow that man to come and be in his presence was gracious enough. But then he chooses to forgive him. He chooses to forgive him. How do we come into the presence of this holy and all-powerful God? Only by grace. It's only by grace that we can stand before this all-powerful and holy God in my sinful body and come to Him full of confidence. It's only by grace. Have you ever stood in the presence of greatness? When I was a little leaguer, my, one of the heroes of baseball for me was Mark McGuire. You guys remember Mark, like, you know, the steroid guy, but, right? It was pre-steroids. Um, late 80s, I was a little leaguer, and I grew up just outside of Oakland, and yeah, I'm, I'm gangster like that. Um, 
grew up just outside of Oakland, and, and the A's were my favorite team, and, and so I, like, he was like one of my heroes. Him and Ricky Henderson were, were, my, were my heroes of baseball. I wanted to be like them. And on Little League Day, they used to be able to let the Little Leaguers go onto the field before games at times, and you'd go there with your entire team, and you'd get to uh, walk the warning track, and the players would go out to the warning track, and there was like this fence, you know, and the players would meet and greet these Little Leaguers, and I was like nine, ten years old, and I remember when Mark McGuire came up to me, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty big dude now, but I was a little dude back then. You know, I was like four foot nothing back then. And, uh, and, and McGuire comes by, and he is just ginormous. Like, this, this was a man amongst men, right? Like, he was just humongous. And I, as a kid, could not believe how big this man was. Like, I had seen him on TV. I had his poster in my room, but I had never seen him in person before. And I was like, Oh my gosh, my eyes were just like this. Like I couldn't believe that I was standing in the presence of someone like that. And seeing him completely changed my posture. Because at that moment as a kid, I was like, I am standing in front of the great and all-powerful Mark McGuire. And I'll never forget, I was trying to get his autograph, and there was a, there was a gate right here. And my dad was trying to get a picture of me with him, but there were kids all over the place. And I was just like fighting to get up there, maybe because I was the little one or whatever. But like, he literally reaches over the gate and he picks me up over the gate. Because I couldn't be, I couldn't, like, I was like, you know, I was like Zacchaeus trying to get through. Like, <laughs> and he, he, he picks me up and he pulls me back like five feet off the fence, puts his arm around and lets my dad take a picture. I was the only kid that he did that for. Yeah. It's, I mean, he knew, no. He knew, he knew that I was in, he was in the presence of greatness, but, but no. But like, you know, it was one of those instances where like, in all honesty, like, I felt like I was literally in the presence, and I was so like, like, I felt unworthy that he would choose me to pull me up over that gate and allow my dad to take a picture of me with him. And you can just imagine, like, if you've ever had that opportunity before where it's like your sports hero or celebrity figure or whatever, you know, like, whatever it may be. But, like, this, in the, the Isaiah is standing in front of the throne room of God. That the power and the holiness, that he was just jaw-dropped. And so I want to challenge us as we stand before this God in our daily lives. I believe there's several things that we need to reorient the way that we think and the way that we posture ourselves before God. And the first one is that I think we need to have a healthier fear of God. Not an unhealthy fear, like God's going to strike me dead at any point, or if I go to church, lightning's going to strike, or if I sin, he's going to punish me in some way. Like, there is, there's elements of that, that there's some, some truth to that, but a healthy fear of God is what the Bible says all of us need to have is that we walk through this life being like, I'm not in control, you are. I surrender my life to you because ultimately you're in charge of my life. I'm not in control. Proverbs 9.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I think for so many, we got... We got to recapture this understanding that God is in control of our lives. He sees everything. He sees the good and the bad and the ugly. And our lives should be lived in light of the fact that this holy and all-powerful God is with us through it all. And in the moment that our pride elevates ourselves to the point where we are in charge, God help us that His power doesn't put us back in our place fully. A healthy fear of God. The second thing that this teaches me about my posture before God is that every single one of us stand in the reality of our own sinfulness. When we stand before God, when we stand before, I'll say this again, but when we stand before a holy God, it shows us just how sinful we really are. See, we make the mistake in our lives of comparing ourselves to other people, right? I'm not as bad as my wife, right? I'm not as bad as her, like that, you know, she's in the cubicle two down from me, like she's a piece of work, right? Like, I'm not as bad as her. 
Bible says don't compare yourselves to each other because, you know, that'll either lead to pride or, or, um, or despair. But when we compare ourselves before God, we have a healthy sense not only of who He is as a holy God, but we have a healthy sense of just how much sin is in my own life. We stand in the presence, when we stand in the presence of God, we're also standing in the muck of our own sin, which is why Isaiah is like, woe to me. And the second phrase out of his mouth was, I am a sinner. This is a hard truth in our culture today because we live in a culture that says everyone's good and everyone can do whatever they want. The Bible says that we're all sinners in need of God's forgiveness. Those are two very contrasting philosophies of life. And when Isaiah stood before God in the throne room of God, he's like, I am a sinner. And I am unworthy to be standing in front of a holy God. And not only am I a person of unclean lips, but I live among a people of unclean lips as well. All of his sin and all of the world's sin was so exposed to Isaiah in that moment. It was undeniable. And the last thing that I see in this is that we also stand unworthy of God's grace and His mercy in our lives. We're just so unworthy. But God, in His grace and in His mercy, takes that piece of coal off the altar and He offers it to every single one of us. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 is actually a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because what Jesus Christ did on the cross was that while we were still sinners and we were dead in our sin and we were all enemies of God, God sent His Son Jesus Christ into the world to give His life for us and to do all the work to save us from our sins. He just offers us the gift of salvation. He offers us the gift of forgiveness. And He says, you don't need to follow some religious system to try to make yourself clean. You don't need to go through any motions of being in church or this or that or whatever. He says, I'm going to send my son Jesus into the world and he's going to give his life and his blood shed on the cross is going to atone for your sins so that your guilt and your shame is completely taken away. So that you and I can stand in the presence of a holy God for all of eternity. For without the atonement of our sins, we cannot stand in eternity before a holy God. That's what the Bible teaches about who God is and about who we are. And so just as God says, I'm offering this piece of coal before you, Isaiah, so that you can be cleansed from your sin. So God sent his son Jesus into this world to say, my son gave his life on the cross for you so that you could have your sins atoned for. And you can stand with confidence before your God as you live on this earth and in all of eternity from this day forward. That's what God does in His grace before us. And we stand before Him with that type of a posture. I mean, how often, if we could just be honest with ourselves, how often does our posture change when we know that we're entering into the presence of God like this? It should and when I say should, I'm indicting myself in this, that it should create a sense of awe and worship for every single one of us. When we pray, when we open up the scriptures to read God's written, spoken word to every single one of us, we should come to Him with His holiness, understanding His power, but understanding that by His grace alone, I get to hear His voice. By grace alone, I get to sing His praises in church. By grace alone, I get to be involved in the fellowship of believers as part of a community. It's only and all by His grace as we stand before a holy and gracious God. And then, in verse 8, God says to I, God deliberates, and He says, Whom shall I send? He's referring to the prophet, the prophet here, Isaiah. And then he says, and who will go for us? Now, this can be a little bit of a confusing word here. He's not just talking about me and the angels. This is one of the Old Testament hints of God as what we would be known as a royal we. 
is that God just does not exist as one, but He exists also as many, and He deliberates as a royal we king as decisions are made amongst Himself. That's why we're unpacking this idea of the Trinitarian theology. This is one of the places in the Old Testament that hints to that. And in light of all of this, He goes, who will go for us? And then Isaiah simply says, man, God, you can do whatever you want with me. You can do whatever you want. Send me. I'll go. He was so transformed by the power and the holiness and the grace of God that he was like, I will go wherever you tell me to go. That's the response to the gospel. The response to the gospel is to say, yes, I want that sins forgiven, but then also, God, I am all yours. I'm all yours. So I don't know what that means for you. Some in here may say like, man, this is revolutionary. I've never heard this before. I believe it. I want the forgiveness of God in my life. I want to receive the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ today in my life. I need it. I'm a sinner standing before a holy God. Others of us that have been walking with Jesus, maybe we've been walking away and it's time for us to say for the first time in a long time, God, I'll go and do whatever you tell me to do. You need me to go do that, I'll do that. You need me to stop doing that, I'm going to do that. You need me to break up with her, I'll do that. You need me to move on, I'll move on. You tell me what to do, God, and I'm going to do it. Here I am, send me. I don't know what your response is this morning, but the invitation is laid out before every single one of us in light of Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. Because God's like, hey, whoever wants it can have it. And if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, but today is the day you say, yes, today I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. All you got to do is stand before God in prayer in your heart of hearts and say, Jesus, I want to follow you with my life. I believe that you are who you say you are. And I ask for forgiveness. I stand as a sinner before a holy God. And here I am, send me. The Bible promises that in that moment, you go from death to life. You are a transformed soul. And that is the promise that God gives to every single one of us. He is holy, He is powerful, and He is gracious. Let's pray.